Doug, let's go back to the text itself and kind of walk through some of these passages that have been raised as issues and problems and so forth. So let's begin with Genesis 1.1. What do we see here that we look at it and we say, you know, if we lose this from a historical perspective, what happens? I'm going back to Wolfgang Capito and his Hexameron in the 1530s in Strasbourg, Calvin's friend. And he said, creation, Genesis 1-1, is the head of the divine philosophy. Basically, it shows us that God is the maker of all things out of nothing. Originally, it was nothing but God, mm -hmm. the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. There was no sun, moon, stars, dust, atoms. And all of that comes, as Capito has said, the head of the divine philosophy is a triune God speaking these worlds into existence and then shaping them in the direction that he wished them mm -hmm. to go. Yeah. So there is some shaping that God does. He mm -hmm. creates and yeah. then he begins to work as a craftsman. Yes, yes, that's right. You know, the word in Greek, plus sign, kind of move things. And so we see in the six days of creation, there was the act of original true creation of all things out of nothing on the first day. And then much of the rest of the time, it is shaping. Sometimes it's by separating, say, light from darkness, earth from water. So separations to make it a habitable world. And then additions, sun, moon, stars, the luminaries added on the fourth day and then later we get the sea creatures, the birds, and then on the sixth day, the land animals, and finally mm -hmm. the crown of creation, mm -hmm. mankind. So it's additions, it's separations. Mm -hmm. It's not always true creation. Part of it is relative creation, but there are uh, places of true creation. They're both there. And both. Mm -hmm. So after Genesis 1-1, mm -hmm. are, are we left, as some people think, are we left with some chaos uh, which would lend to the gap theory? No, uh, not at all. That's not a bit of suggestion of that in Holy Scripture. I can give you the background of it, and it came from a very fine man. I mean, I think a lot of theistic evolutionists are very fine people, mm -hmm. except at that point, perhaps. Dr. Thomas Chalmers was the leader of the evangelical forces in the Church of Scotland in the 1830s and 40s, and ultimately led to the disruption and development of the Free Church out of the Church of Scotland. And he was very much uh, concerned with the intellectual movements and the culture. And he was alert that the geologists were saying the world is very, very old, millions of years old or more, and that lots of fossils actually proved the age of the earth. It had to be millions or hundreds of millions of years old, maybe even evolution. So. He came up with a novel way to approach it, to keep the gospel and keep much of the value of Genesis by saying there's a gap, an imagined gap with this good man between Genesis 1-1 and 1-2. So God made an original creation. Everything was fine. Then there was the fall of Lucifer, who becomes the devil. And in that fall of Lucifer, there seems to have been a, a damaging, uh, almost a destruction of the created order, and then vast amounts of time later, there comes to be a new restoration, and then he puts mm -hmm. in Adam and Eve. That's a preposterous. Something that important would have been mentioned somewhere mm -hmm. else in Scripture. It never is. Now, you do have, I believe it's Isaiah 45, that the world was not created tohu. That is, it was not created to be empty and uninhabited. Mm -hmm. But there's nothing there about... Um, mm -hmm supposed prehistoric fall before man was created. It's a, it is a desire, part of the post-enlightenment response of evangelical Christians to the theory, uh, which they didn't say it's a theory, they said it's empirically proved that the world is hundreds of millions of years old and the fossils point to that and also point mm. to evolutionary development, which actually they don't. So he was trying to respond to that. Mm -hmm. 
it's interesting to study because it's what we mustn't do. We must not import into the text something to make our message more palatable, more acceptable mm -hmm. to secularists. We mustn't do it. He meant well. Mm -hmm. Yes, he did. But it's not the thing to do. What is the role of general revelation? They, they were looking at geology, they were mm -hmm. looking at rocks, and then uh, supposedly the scientific mm -hmm. theory is, uh, comes to rise that there are, there are millions of years uh, mm -hmm. as evidence in the rock. What is, what is the proper uh, hermeneutical approach to general revelation and then the special revelation? Okay, I think you would certainly want to go to Romans 1 and Romans 2, Psalm 19, Psalm 8, and the nature Psalm 65 mm -hmm. and such, and say there are two things that we learn about God from being part of the created order, from general revelation, namely the generality, the nature. First of all, by being part of the created order, we know there's a creator. You could not have these things unless something made it. Mm. One of the early church writers, Tertullian, says in one of his writings that basically every child comes here believing in creation, that there's a creator because they see how amazing it is, had to be a big God. And he says, that's what everybody accepts unless the philosophers get hold of you. And he is writing that in the third mm, century, mm, Tertullian. Yeah. So first of all, from general revelation, creation says it's a creator. Secondly, generally we have a conscience. It's a moral monitor inside of us. Uh, either our thoughts excusing us when we did well or accusing us mm. when we did wrong, which shows there is a moral lawgiver to whom we're mm. bound. And some say religio, religion means bound. So therefore, in general revelation, you have the sense there's a creator and there's a moral lawgiver and I'm bound to him. However, I don't know how much further you can go than that uh, with general revelation for this reason. Romans 1.18 says that because of the fall, because of Adam's rebating against God and then what it did to the nature of his children, all who would be descended from him, which includes we here talking today, mm -hmm. uh, that they suppress the truths they already know. It says, it uses in Greek, kot echo, which means mankind holds down or suppresses the truth in unrighteousness. Mm -hmm. King James just says holds, but that's not as good a translation. It should be holds it down, suppresses it. So therefore there is a bias in mm -hmm. human nature that is not objectively open to what we get in general revelation, namely there's a creator that made this creation. There's a moral monitor that makes you feel guilty or good about what you do. So we have ways to suppress it, to evade God. Mm -hmm. And therefore, general revelation will make you inexcusable on the last day. That's the premise of the last judgment. God will not judge a person because he did not believe the Bible if he or she didn't have a Bible. That mm. is not what he does. He only judges you in accordance with the amount of light you have. No more, no less. Everybody has enough light that they'll enter into the final judgment on creation and conscience. Now, those that have had more privilege will be judged more severely. Namely, you have a Bible, you have much more to answer for. So that's general revelation. It won't take you very far, but it's the premise of the last judgment. It's very important. Mm -hmm. Now you would have to have special revelation, God speaking to you in order to understand more about who he is, mm -hmm. how to be saved and how he wants you to live. Mm -hmm. So the revelation that God has given us uh, in his creation around us is sufficient mm -hmm. uh, for man to be without excuse, as, yes. as Paul is saying. Correct. And it declares the glory of God. Mm -hmm. So it, it speaks truly, it speaks yes. clearly. But what you're saying is in our fallen state, we have, yeah. a, we have a tendency, if mm -hmm. not an over tendency, yeah. uh, to want to see it in the way we want to see it. Yeah, there's no problem with the radio station sending out the message. The problem mm -hmm. is in 
in the, the receiver, receiver in us. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let's move a little further into the text. In fact, let's just let's just talk about the notion of, of days here for mm -hmm. a second, because we're 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 at the point where we're about to have the first morning, evening, yeah. and morning. Uh, let's talk about that word yom. It's 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 mm -hmm. been examined and tossed back and forth. Yeah. Let's talk about that word for a minute. In general, there was never any question as to the meaning of day, either among the rabbi commentators or Roman Catholics, Eastern Orthodox or Protestants until the rise of the theories of historic geology requiring vast ages and then mm -hmm. evolutionary development. Now in the Bible itself, the word yom almost invariably means uh, a day either of 24 hours or the daylight portion of that day. There are a very few instances where it could say in the days of the barley harvest mm -hmm. or something like that, but then, or a thousand years, and Second Peter is with the Lord is a day, but there the immediate context says it's being used in a different mm -hmm. way from 24 hour day. You know, some should say in, in Hosea, the third day he'll raise us up, maybe it's being used in a special way. But I, I could name them maybe three or four places out of 150 uses at least of yom, and it means 24 hour day or daylight portion mm -hmm. thereof. And there's no problem with understanding that from within the text. The only problem is if you import modern, when I say modern, say 250 mm -hmm. year old, mm -hmm. enlightenment and post enlightenment theories as to a massively vast age of a universe that would accommodate the possibility first of chemical evolution and then of biological evolution. Uh, that's the only problem there is with understanding day. Mm -hmm. It's clear to understand day. There's some things in the Bible much, much <clears throat> harder than that. That's clear. Yeah. Now, some people have attempted to try and criticize um, the historical reading of the text by bringing up uh, what they would call inconsistencies or issues or problems. Let's deal with a couple of those. Mm -hmm. One of those is, is the uh, problem that supposedly is raised associated with the fact that the sun uh, was not mm -hmm. created um, until uh, late in the period of creation when we need light before that. Mm -hmm. Yes, of course. It's clear from the Genesis account, the sun as such was not created till the fourth day. Mm -hmm. And yet there's light because it's the evening and the morning. Yes. Erev Boker yes. <clears throat> from day one. I like what um, the wonderful Jewish commentator Umberto Casuto wrote in his commentary on Genesis. He's never lived, unfortunately, to finish the whole thing, but he did several mm -hmm. chapters and it is marvelous. And he was what you call a Tanitic Jew. I mean, believes the Torah, not a liberal Jew. He says that, of course, there was light before the sun was created because God controls the light. He says what happened on the fourth day, and I love this almost poetic beauty of the word. He said there was a crystallization of the light mm. into the sun mm. and the luminaries. John Calvin says in his commentary on Genesis, yes, the sun was only created on the fourth day. And that's because God likes to keep the light in his hand and to show that the sun is not needed further to be light because God is light. Mm -hmm. Others have thought that the light was there from the theophanic presence of God, as in the desert, the fiery, cloudy pillar. Mm -hmm. Whatever, God was not dependent on the sun for the light, but the sun had its purpose from the fourth day mm -hmm. and on, onward. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That would seem to raise a, an even deeper problem for someone who is trying to read Yom uh, in a very long, long period of time. Mm -hmm. Now, we don't just have a few days mm -hmm. uh, between uh, day one and day four, but now we have a very, very long period of time, millions of years, maybe in billions of years, uh, from the textual perspective of even having a sun. So those who are trying to place a lot of time in the word yom also end up stumbling over the the notion that the sun is not created until the fourth day. Right, either you take in simple faith, simple and profound and humble faith as a servant of God, 
the Word of God is written. You should take it whole and entire or you don't take it that way and therefore you leave yourself the authority to get your bearings from wherever the current intellectual culture is at any one mm -hmm. time such that you're not prepared to accept a relatively short period of time that the sun has been here. But then when you do that, you have real problems, I think, with the Lordship of Christ. Mm -hmm. And I just can't do it sure. for that reason and mm -hmm. see no intellectual reason for it. Many of the problems raised in the first 11 chapters of Genesis are only because people start with the current intellectual theories of the last 200 mm -hmm. and some years of ancient ages of the earth, evolution, and so they almost make it arcane and difficult yes. so that it would look like they are faithful believers as they deal with this text. Mm -hmm. They may be true believers, I don't doubt it, but I don't think they're faithful. I don't think they're humble if they give themselves a right to correct a plain reading of scripture. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I don't mean to speak judgmentally or harshly, but honestly, I have to sure. say as a humble Christian, I have to say that. Mm -hmm.